Um, I, and I think our, our three presenters this morning have given us all a, a, a pretty rich tableau here of the trends and tendencies underway in Sub-Saharan Africa pushing uh, on the one hand towards greater democratization, transparency and accountability, trends and tendencies pulling back in, in the other direction, and then taking a look at how the events of the Arab Spring have, have interacted and, and, and shaped some of those trends and tendencies. I would be very interested in hearing a little more about whether the example of people power, uh, the example of people in the streets uh, in North Africa has resonated in Sub-Saharan Africa. Um, but I'm going to save my question uh, and, and, and go and open this up right away to all of you um, and, and ask that uh, if you um, would like to make a comment, an observation, or ask a question, please use the microphone. Just briefly uh, identify yourself and um, if you could, uh, in the interest of time, we will run over a little bit. I mean, we, we are not strictly limited. I know some of you may be. We may end up running over a little bit here, which is fine. But in the interest of time, if you could be relatively relatively brief in your comment or your or your question. Okay. Thank you, Ambassador. Uh, my name is Kamal Bayolo. I'm the resident scholar on the Middle East, North Africa, and Islamic Studies at the National War College. Thanks. Thanks. Um, I'm very heartened, of course, by the wonderful uh, panel that you that you helped put together this morning. Uh, very quickly, um, given uh, I want to sort of reverse the process instead of focusing uh, primarily on Sub-Saharan Africa, let's I want to bring the discussion a little bit to North Africa. Given the uh, seeming and in initial reluctance of the AU and other African states to play a role, to jump on the bandwagon, or play a role, in essence, in the uh, Arab Spring, uh, I'm wondering, in essence, uh, what can the AU and Africa today, especially sub-Saharan African countries, what can they really do in terms of helping the evolving and fragile democratic developments in North Africa? Good morning. Thank you for your presentations. My name is Rachel Smith from Headquarters Department of the Army. I was wondering, um, in your countervailing forces portion of your report, I have not had an opportunity yet to read the entire report. I'll preface with that. But in the countervailing forces, was there an opportunity or did you uh, review some of the other external forces outside of China and Libya, such as extremist elements or the illicit activities throughout the continent that uh, can act as destabilizers to the democratic growth, and if there's any kind of direct influence from those activities as well. Thank you. Uh, I'm Lawrence Freeman from Executive Intelligence Review on the Africa desk. I've been studying Africa for about 25 years, and from reading over the report quickly and listening to the presentations, I think there's a crucial dimension that's been left out, which would be a great strategic era, if I'm correct, which is the economic dimension that was prevalent in the Arab Spring and is now seeping its way down to Sub-Saharan Africa will be actually be devastating. Because if you look at the people in Egypt especially, I got a bird's eye view because I was in Khartoum at the time, watching it on TV 24 hours a day, and you see 25 to 40 year old young people and they're out there protesting because they don't see a future. Yes, there was an autocratic government, but the economic policies were devastating and not allowing young people to see an economic future. Uh, in Tunisia, it wasn't just the government, the entire West, including the IMF, praised the Tunisian economy, and I had no reason to, because you have to look at, are we helping the people in the physical economic standard of living, in power, in food? And this is what the key ingredient that can set off more explosions in sub-Saharan Africa, in Nigeria, You've had four so-called democratic elections, although some people tell me things were better under Abacha. I was there during the Abacha years. But in any case, our cell phones and making quick money in Victoria Island is not going to solve the serious problems. If there's not electrical power delivered very quickly, I'm very fearful about the continuation of a full four-year term of Good Luck Jonathan. So I think we have to look at these revolts as being very much coming from real fundamental economic conditions. You have huge populations, a lot of young people, they don't see a future. I think this is behind some of the elements of Boko Haram. Uh, when I was in the Niger Delta, I saw this among the young people there. If they don't know they can have a job, raise a family, succeed, that government, democratic or not, is not going to stand in the way. If there's revolts in places like Nigeria and other places, you could have a tsunami of protests 
across the country, across the continent. So I don't see that this economic, real economic question, I'm not talking about statistics and fast money, but for the people, I don't see that question being taken up in this report adequately. I could be wrong. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you for introducing it. It's a good question. I'm sure our, our presenters will have something to say about it. Why don't we, why don't I turn it over to Joe, Chris, and, uh, and Ned to you all. Kamal's question, uh, let any of you take a, take a crack at that. And the question here from, uh, from Rachel on um, extremist and illicit, illicit elements the threat represented, and then, and then Lawrence Freeman's question about the economic dimension. Are we overlooking that? Thank you. Uh, I'll uh, say something about the last two questions, and I think uh, Chris and Ned uh, will uh, have plenty to say on the, on the, on the first one. Um, with regards to the issue of uh, illicit actors and extremist elements, um, it is something that we talk about. Uh, uh, we address it in the context of the uh, breakup of the Gaddafi regime and how uh, these forces, the mercenaries and the arms, are feeding in to the um, growing strength of AQIM, uh, who are uh, also um, uh, coming increasingly together with uh, transnational organized crime uh, actors and nar narco traffickers in, in the region. This confluence we do see as uh, in composite uh, posing the threat to um, the democratization process in that region. Um, uh, as we uh, have gone through the review process, it's actually something I think we should have given more attention to. Uh, in some of our other publications at the center, we, we've talked uh, quite a bit about the threat of, of traffickers in West Africa and uh, the threat that this poses to state capture uh, in, in, in a number of these countries. And I think, uh, indeed, that is another countervailing force that we need to be paying attention to. Uh, with regards to the economic dimensions, in fact, we do deal with it uh, uh, in our uh, discussion. We talk about various um, factors that have historically led to change. And uh, um, economic stagnation is a key factor. In fact, 70% uh, of the autocratic or uh, democratic reversals globally are result are taking place in countries that are facing economic stagnation. In Africa, it's 90%. Um, and so it's something we definitely want to pay attention to. It is a, uh, a variable we, we've reviewed. It's in uh, several of our tables. We also look at the um, developmental implications of that. So in Africa, as many of you know, there is a distorted notion of, uh, of economic growth. Many autocrats um, bene are benefited by their oil wealth. This doesn't translate into development in terms of socioeconomic improvements. And so we like to bring out that difference uh, looking at developmental progress. And indeed, um, bridging on one of Chris's uh, points, there is a very strong uh, linkage between longevity in office and underperformance on these development and economic indicators. And so absolutely uh, part of the genesis of the protests in North Africa, as well as the residents in Sub-Saharan Africa, is this uh, gap between uh, expectation and uh, delivery uh, economically, uh, which is closely tied to corruption, uh, another factor that we, we've taken a close look at. So it's, it's in there. Uh, it's mixed in with uh, several of our different sections. Um, I would just say to add um, to Joe's uh, response to Lawrence that I think that's, that's a very important issue and one that uh, we should probably continue to explore and other people should explore as well because we're very familiar with um, some of the food riots in a number of African countries in 2007 and 2008 uh, and the fact that those food riots did capture the frustrations of ordinary citizens who didn't see an improvement in their well-being. Uh, and in a number of countries, uh, the, those grievances were intertwined with political aspirations. Uh, for example, with the debate about the modification of the constitution in a number of countries. Uh, so there's always um, that economic component that we have to look at. Uh, and then the point that you, you raised, I think it's very pertinent, how the 
the statistics, which, and I'm glad you made that distinction by saying let's not just look at the statistics of economic growth in Africa and the percentages that get thrown out by various international financial institutions. Let's try to find other parameters that capture the well-being of ordinary citizens, because that's what doesn't get reflected in, in reports. Um, the Niger Delta in Nigeria uh, probably got aggravated in Abacha's time, uh, because when some of those young people from the Niger Delta got invited into Abuja by Abacha, and they saw how much investments had been made in the capital city of Abuja with resources coming out of the Niger Delta, uh, which didn't reflect what they were living through on a daily basis, they became even more radical. Um, I doubt that there would be a Nigerian today who would have preferred the Abuja regime. We can always make the case for better performance, uh, but I think the basic human rights are things that even Nigerians value very highly. Um, in, in terms of Kamal's point, I think the, the AU needs to do a lot of damage control uh, with, regards of the, uh, with regards to its relationship with uh, the member states from Northern Africa. Um, interestingly, all three countries, Egypt, Libya and Tunisia uh, are very important members of the African Union for various reasons, and, th and they play a very important role. Um, and, but it was so obvious that the AU was behind the curve. Uh, I think the, there's going to have to be some fence mending in, in diplomatic, you know, through diplomatic uh, channels to be able to have the AU regain the favor of the new governments of the day in, in these three countries. The one silver lining in all of that, uh, in the case of Libya, for example, was the fact that uh, well over 20 African countries uh, at the an AU sitting did recognize Libya even before the AU, uh, which means that those countries, Nigeria inclusive, uh, could then step up to the plate and play a more lead role in bring in, in creating more harmony uh, within the organization with regards to the current governments in, in those three countries. I think there are a number of key issues. The, the fragility of Sahelian countries with regards to terrorism in the Sahel, uh, the spread of light weapons coming out of Libya uh, into that region. Those are key issues that no one country is going to be able to resolve on its own. Uh, and these are issues that may call, would, would necessarily have to call into play a more effective uh, assertion of authority by the regional or sub-regional bodies. Uh, and I don't think they will be able to play that role except um, until they reconcile themselves with the governments of the day in these countries. The whole question of uh, immigrant workers uh, from other African countries that were working in, in Libya, uh, that issue is going to have to be resolved. It's not going to be resolved by just one country negotiating on a bilateral basis. It's going to be resolved with the regional bodies playing a more prominent role. Uh, and I'm hoping, I'm hoping that uh, all of these issues are being recognized by the top leadership of the African Union. Uh, if not, they probably ought to be reminded. Uh, it's just a reality that, that the EU, I, the AU, I believe, is struggling with. Uh, a happenstance in terms of the current leadership, in the sense that chairman uh, of the AU at this point, when all of these things are breaking out through the, through the continent, happens to be uh, one of the longest serving leaders on the continent in terms of uh, President Obiang of Equatorial Guinea. Uh, he's not going to raise a finger to make a case for democratic governance, mm -hmm. and that's very unfortunate. So, uh, just quickly, two thoughts. Um, um, you know, one is that there, there's a wealth of experience uh, in Sub-Saharan Africa to share uh, with uh, with states in uh, in the MENA region. Um, just to cite one example, I think I think people, some some folks from Niger, would have some very interesting things to say about legislative executive relations. You know, in a democracy, with 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 Niger's experience of having had a coup and gone back and forth a couple of times. Uh, so I think there's there's a lot of areas of the function of democratic institutions where there's information that could be very usefully shared. Um, the, and then the other thing is simply, the, uh, you know, another area is the area of international institutions. And I think that, that democratic states in Africa can, can be supportive of, of these transitions uh, in international institutions, not only in the, you know, in, in, the, in the UN, but, but, uh, but even, you know, some states belong to the OIC, for example. And, uh, so I think, I think there's, there's definitely some grounds for, uh, for useful communication and contact there. Thank you. I'm Michael Kraft. I worked here a few years ago at Africa Center. But in an earlier career, I worked as a journalist in uh, Central Africa, including Zimbabwe. I was wondering, do you, do you all see 
the Arab Spring have any, any impact on hardcore dictatorships uh, like Mugabe's um, sanctions have been tried to a certain extent, or perhaps uh, Zimbabwe been a model for Syria in terms of ruthless repression of the opposition. I mean, it seems to me the opposition are pretty well demoralized. <coughs> that could be wrong. Thank you. I just wondered along the lines of the ambassador asked uh, whether the panel could elaborate a bit more on the sort of question about a more to be a little bit more specific about the impacts uh, of the uh, example of the Arab Spring on on whether or not there have been uh, um, reactions in sub-Saharan Africa yes or no why, why you know, what specifically how is how is the example of the Arab Spring provided triggers or drivers which we've talked about but this one's a little more depth on that I'm uh, General Kishli I'm Jefferson Kishli Ambassador Barbie thank you for this uh, valuable report. I'm just, it's not a question, I just want to clarify some part what I read here is that I want to clear some uh, comment, uh, some statement here. Uh, they say Egypt is a civil society network continuing to push uh, reform in the face of the ambiguous commitment on the part of the military government to the real democratic. So we don't have a military government. We have an Egyptian military who impose this law. We don't seek to go to this law, to play this law. So we have a military, uh, uh, the Egyptian armed forces, who lead this fight for the transition to transfer the authority to the civilian uh, people who will come next. And uh, there is no ambiguous commitment. There is a very clear map for the next time. But uh, culturally, as a military people, we don't use to use the media as a tool. This is a mistake from our people. We don't know how to use this. Uh, media to explain to the people, to explain to the foreigner media. So we don't, uh, we have a very clear plan. We will going through it, start from 22nd of November for this election to be end in January, and we'll have another election after we have this, our constitution. So, and also that uh, real democratic change is not going to happen between day and night. We are now seven months. Democratic, real democratic, need a lot of time. It needs education. It needs something. The people on the streets do not understand. The civil society on the streets do not understand. They get a lot of money from different places, like the Gulf area, Europe, here in the state. They distribute the money for this civil society on the street. So it create a lot of chaos, a lot of mess. The people don't understand what they need. They keep raising their demand for you know for, for nothing. So I think the law here is not allowed to any foreigner money to be distributed for here for any civil society, for all NGO. So we keep receiving the money from different places. That's create this uh, NGO who making problem, not solving or looking for the future, or looking for a strategic vision for the Egyptian economy and what we're facing now. Just I want to clarify something. Like that. Thank you, sir. sir. Thank you. Jolie Frank, Frontier Markets Partners. Uh, thank you for the report and uh, the importance of the subject. Uh, there is a country or a region which uh, it has been argued is among the most democratic in all of northern Africa and that's Somaliland and irrespective of the overall Somalia crisis one cannot help but admire the fact that for 20 years there have been multiple elections observed peaceful turnovers of power, a written constitution of their own sort of bicameral legislature that appears to be working, and to use two of the terms you talked about, the uh, placement of democratic institutions and legitimacy in the eyes of its people with the exception of one small group on the east over uh, near Puntland. If, uh, for intellectual completeness, if nothing else, it would seem that the report should look at 
uh, and comparisons are odious, so I won't say it's the best, but it's certainly among one of the best representations of the democratic uh, uh, government on the entire continent. Let me uh, respond to a couple of the questions, and uh, um, again, uh, Chris and, and Ned can pick up uh, on those issues that uh, they feel they have the most to say about. Um, with regards to the impact of the Arab Spring on the hardcore autocrats, and I think this ties into the point on citizen voice as well, what we are seeing is that the Arab Spring is having an impact on Africa. It's happen it's, it, the impact, though, is in a, a different way. We are expecting to see sudden massive protest um, that are leading to the toppling of regimes in Africa. Rather, the changes happening, and I think the argument could be made, uh, it, it fits the North Africa situation as well. Change happens when there is some institutional basis there in which that anger and demand for change can uh, lock onto. And it is when, it's those underlying drivers of change that are really going to sustain the process. A one-time uh, one protest isn't enough to affect change. You need that organizational capacity of civil society, which you had in uh, Egypt and Tunisia, and uh, which is percolating in a number of African countries for that change to happen. Uh, you need the media. You need people to be informed. Uh, you need some of these other institutional drivers to push that change. And so uh, with regards to Zimbabwe, um, actually, I think the Arab Spring is putting pressure on Zimbabwe. It is, uh, among all of the Africa's autocrats, there is a ratcheting of pressure. They are coming under increased scrutiny for their lack of legitimacy. There's less tolerance for their claims for uh, on authority or their stolen elections. Um, and so they are, I think, uh, feeling a greater need to justify their positions, both domestically and internationally. And I think it is that uh, angle to which we uh, will see the Arab Spring continue to play out and uh, to see more pointed questioning on these questions of legitimacy. And as we put out in the report, citizen voice is critical. Um, uh, civil society is typically the actor that takes the lead on these demands and, uh, and, and uh, um, getting out in front in terms of organizing the population and articulating the change that is needed. And so a big variable on which countries are going to see more movement more quickly is the, the sophistication and the commitment, the organizational capacity of civil society in Africa. Let me give you a chance to go first. Yeah, I'll, okay, thanks, Chris. Yes. Uh, uh, yeah, I'll, I'll just make a very simple point. And, and it really relates, I think, to both of these comments and, and to what Joe said. And that is, is, is sort of what timeline are we, are we looking at? And, uh, um, uh, I think I think that Zimbabwe is going to be a freer country uh, at some point in the not too distant future, uh, in large part because of what has been going on. Uh, and um, sort of similarly, I, I would uh, I think that uh, while there, there may not have been the the exact uh, replication uh, in sub-Saharan Africa of some of these some of these protests, I think the underlying issues of greater pluralism. Uh, and, and a sense of a desire for, for better governance uh, are, uh, are at, <clears throat> at the root of a lot of the um, um, political equations in countries today. I just came back from Senegal where there's a very, very uh, lively debate going on, shall we say, about, uh, about governance and longevity and power. So I, it's, a, it's kind of a question of a timeline about, you know, things may not happen right away, but there's an arc of, of history that I, that I would argue at, at play here. Um, I think the points about Somaliland were, 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 uh, were very good. I, I don't think that this report was, was really, um, we had enough on our plate uh, to, to, to go beyond that and then sort of look at issues of, of um, non-traditional nation state um, situations in Africa. Um, but uh, I, I think that a lot of the issues in the report are very relevant for Somaliland. Thank you. On the um, 
Zimbabwe and the direct impact of uh, the Arab Spring. I think uh, you put it very rightly, the regime in Zimbabwe is feeling a lot more uh, stress and, and pressure. Um, we've also seen, we, real, we remember that uh, the government of Zimbabwe expelled the Libyan ambassador uh, for recognizing the um, uh, CNT uh, in the early part of, of, of the process in Libya. Uh, but in recent days, they've been going at length to try to explain and rationalize and justify their position vis-a-vis -vis Libya. Um, we've seen uh, just last weekend uh, a constitutional referendum in Equatorial Guinea. Uh, you could argue with the merits and the content, uh, and the opposition had a lot to say about it, uh, but nobody would have expected six months ago that uh, Obiang Gema of Equatorial Guinea would talk about a constitutional, <coughs> would talk about constitutional reform and even right into the new constitution, term limits that said, you know, you wouldn't serve more than two five-year terms. Uh, that's, that's a novelty even for, for Equatorial Guinea. Um, I think, as I said earlier too, uh, autocrats, all habits die hard. <coughs> and a lot of these remaining autocrats probably wouldn't, would, wouldn't go down without a fight. Uh, but we should be looking for a dominoes effect. Uh, if you look at African history and the, the history of political developments on the continent, uh, it takes one country to make a move and then ultimately other countries follow. Um, and while Northern Africa is considered part of the continent, I think Sub-Saharan Africa hasn't yet had the one case that would stand forward. Uh, you remember the whole debate about independence, once Ghana started and Guinea, then everybody wanted independence. And then we had the national conferences, Benin started and then every country wanted a national conference. Uh, so my sense is, as we talk about the Senegals and the Ugandas and the Zimbabwe's and you know uh, the Cameroons, the Equatorial Guineas, one of these countries is going to have give somewhere, and then we have a series of events in Sub-Saharan Africa that will go along those lines. Uh, but if the autocrats survive and stifle any dissent, then it may take a much longer effort uh, to see a direct impact, the way that it could be recorded and directly linked to what is transpired in North Africa. Um, Somaliland, it's, it's a big issue, I think, uh, for Africanists, for, for many academics. It's, it's a dilemma for the African Union because of the, the initial charter around the African uh, Organization of African Unity and in 1963, Article 3 of the 1963 um, Act, which said the borders that were inherited and independence were invaluable. So countries are grappling with that. And now we have South Sudan. Um, is that going to give more momentum for the people making a case for Somaliland? That's, that's an open question, but it's a big question worth studying. Let me just make a comment about the clarification by the general, and I, I appreciate that clarification, and it's very useful. It will inform the working group's discussions uh, going forward. But I also think that we have to be cognizant of the fact that despite the support that organizations, civil society organizations can receive from the West or from other countries, there is nothing as precious as life. And the most valuable contribution to democratic reform across Africa is the lives of the people who put, the people who put their lives on the line on a daily basis. It's not the financial rewards. Uh, it's not the resources that they receive. Because after all, governments receive resources from similar governments. And no one would criticize or call into question the patriotism of those that lead governments for receiving financial assistance from these Western governments or Western financial institutions. So I think while we could be critical of civil society, we should be mindful of the fact that the source of financial support is minimal compared to the risk of having to put your life on the line on a daily basis, and we should at least recognize that uh, from our civil society organizations. My question addresses not the report itself, but the core assumption of the report, namely that democracy still matters in Africa. And I'm not asking this question facetiously, and certainly there's a lot of evidence out there that democracy is both a superior philosophical uh, principle and a superior mode of governance. However, in the African context, um, does democracy still matter in terms of economic outcomes? And I'm asking this question because of the emergence in the past few years of what many have called the, the African lions, um, Rwanda, Ethiopia, and of course, Uganda. And like their counterparts in Asia, they may fail miserably on Freedom House's measures of democracy, but they actually perform extremely well 
uh, in terms of the Millennium Development Goals, their performance when meeting the Millennium Development Goals. And I think all of those countries are on track to meet at least four out of five of the NDG goals. So um, I'd like to ask you to address this question, not only because I think it's interesting for a room of Africanists to contemplate this question, but actually because I think it does feed back into the report. Because if there is a perception that there is a growing disconnect between democratic governance and development outcomes, not economic growth in general, but actual development outcomes as measured by MDG goals. Um, this could fuel um, a rollback of the democratic progress over the past two decades. Can you comment on the uh, strategic role that you see the U.S. <coughs> in the region and uh, you really, in particular, to enhance the security also, how this relates um, from a security perspective to the greater Middle East? Uh, I'm not sure. We, your, part of your question, could, I, could you repeat the question again? Try to just quickly Some summarize it because we lost, lost a couple parts of it. I apologize. Uh, can you comment on the strategic role that the U.S. military should play in the region of Northern Africa to aid in enhancing the security posture and then how that relates um, to the greater issues uh, of security in the Middle East. Not sure which of you wants to take that one on, but we will all give it a shot. Uh, okay, we're going to take uh, right here. Yes, sir. Yes. Hello, my name is uh, Patrick Anderson. I'm a Army War College fellow, and most recently I was assigned as the U.S. Defense Attaché in Zimbabwe. Uh, my question gets to your recommendations and sort of uh, from a donor nation perspective. Um, I didn't see very many of those uh, recommendations that wouldn't require some level of donor nation support to, to really uh, realize them. As, uh, uh, and in, in, from a donor nation perspective, especially when we're looking at civil society, the U.S. alone gives about $3 billion a year to support civil society in the form of democracy and good governance programs. Um, with the fiscal realities that exist in the United States and in Europe and you know, foreign aid going to be under more and more scrutiny, how would you prioritize your recommendations or what sort of framework would you use to prioritize your recommendations? Thank you. Okay, uh, my question is, um, after it's not like a uh, question but also comment. Most of like the recommendations that I have here, like from the stages, what has been like usually told, you know, like the media should be free uh, source for uh, Africa, you know, to democratize itself. Like the media should be kind of open, and the uh, political parties should be kind of capable enough to bring about their own. Uh, options and all that but the, the question is the situation there in the continent is not so conducive for all the political forces to play that role the media is not open and then how should we make the media open or like the whole political stage open so that people can express themselves or so that people can bring about the kind of the government they want and I think like that should be like the question we should try to uh, give an answer. Okay, well the media media openness then is your question. And how do we promote greater media openness and you, as a vehicle for articulating demands and pushing for change? Is that a fair, fair summation? Good, that's great, we'll take it. Okay. Chris? Um, I, I'll start with Michelle because I, I thought that uh, the working group had made the case in a way that uh, would uh, have addressed all of our concerns, but I guess we still have our work cut out for us. Um, because I think the, the collapse of the regimes in Tunisia and Libya and Egypt uh, would have made the counter argument that democracy really matters. Um, when you look at um, the, the countries you cite, uh, Rwanda, Uganda, Ethiopia, and their efforts to meet uh, develop, uh, Millennium Development Goals, it's 
difficult to make the comparison because then the open question is, if they were more democratic, would that have inhibited their ability to meet the same goals? It's a question of political will. Uh, if they're putting certain resources into meeting those goals now, uh, and they maintain the same political will when they open up political space, wouldn't they still accomplish the same goals? Uh, the comparison that I would like to make, for example, is with uh, between Botswana and Sierra Leone. Uh, in the 60s, both Botswana and Sierra Leone had the same level of GDP. They said they had the same level of economic development. Both countries have diamonds. Sierra Leone went into authoritarian rule, into military rule, and into civil war, and mis mismanaged its resources. Uh, Botswana, on the other hand, took the democratic path, and over the years has put in place processes and systems to allow res its resources to be properly managed to impact the well-being of its citizens. So. Um, it could be a very long argument, uh, but I would still hold firmly that by putting in place the kinds of processes and structures and institutions that allow for more accountability and more transparency in the management of resources, countries are better able or better apt to meet the, uh, to improve the well-being of their citizens than would be the case otherwise. Uh, look at what Ghana is trying to do today. Uh, look at the, trace the level of economic development in Ghana compared to Cote d'Ivoire. Uh, two decades ago, both countries were almost at the same level, but because of what is transpired in terms of democratic governance in Cote d'Ivoire in the last two decades, the Cote d'Ivoire trajectory has been going south while Ghana is shut up, and uh, shut upwards, I should say. And, and today, people would like to cite Ghana as a success story, uh, both in terms of political development as well as economic development. So I think we shouldn't lose side of that. Guinea, for example, is uh, you know, the, the, the paradox of Guinea-Conakry, because people say Guinea's got more than half of the bauxite re, uh, reserves in the world. It's a country of 12 million people. It's a small country to manage. It's got water resources. It's got, you name it, and they have it. But just because in the last 50 years, Guinea hasn't known a democratic government. They've not been able to manage those resources in a way as to impact the well-being of its citizens. I would dare say that if the current transition in Guinea stays on track, that we will be able to record better results in the next five, 10 years in Guinea than we've done in the first 50 years of independence. Um, let me just skip to the last question. I think the last uh, uh, suggestion had to do with uh, the enabling environment as a whole, not just for the media, but for political parties, to say that these recommendations wouldn't mean anything if the enabling environment is still very hostile. And I think we, that was one of the issues that NET did address in the recommendations to say we collectively, uh, including with African Democrats and <coughs> governments on the continent, we need to work collectively to create an enabling environment for democratic governance to be able to <coughs> prosper. For all of these tenets of democracy, the media, civil society, political parties, women's associations to be able to, uh, to have an impact. Uh, and if that enabling environment is not created, then none of this, um, tenants could survive. The interesting thing about the report, and I, I should say, again to compliment Joe, is that one of the objectives of this report was to generate debate and discussions within the continent. And interestingly, since its release, uh, we're seeing a lot of um, vibrant or very vigorous debate in, in Uganda, uh, in Nigeria, um, and even in other countries outside of the continent about the content of this report. And my sense is that if we could generate a lot of discussions within countries on the recommendations of this report, uh, hopefully we would be able to find enough consensus on the ground to help create that enabling environment. Uh, the donor support uh, component is very relevant, it's useful, but I did say that there are a number of African countries that have the resources, the wherewithal, be able to do without donor support. Uh, this goes to my, uh, Patrick's question, that um, if the resources were properly managed, those countries could put in place even institutions, including endowments, uh, that could help promote and strengthen democratic governance in, within their own countries. Nigeria, for example, is an extremely wealthy country. There is no reason why Nigeria should depend on foreign assistance to support democratic governance and democratic institutions. Uh, but a lot of us get that support and go in and try to work with Nigerians, but it's a country that could create endowments of its own. South Africa could create endowments that could help not just South Africa, but other countries in the Southern Africa sub-region. 
So I think it's a matter of political will. It's also a matter of political leadership on the continent, embracing democratic governance as a tool to help improve the well-being of citizens rather than something that's done to please one donor or, or, or the other. Okay, let me uh, just try to add to um, things. Chris's very precise remarks. And I'll work backwards, um, again, on the media. Uh, um, you know, of the things that we talk about in the report, I would highlight the importance of uh, um, protecting journalists in Africa. Um, some 74 journalists have been killed covering sensitive stories in Africa this decade. Um, and the media is the throughway by which all information is exchanged in a society and, and internationally. Without independent media, we really have a difficult time knowing what's going on and having a uh, candid discussion. Um, and in that way, I would elevate the importance of media for international partners so that, uh, in fact, that even becomes a consideration in the allocation of donor funds. Um, we, we have a lot of empirical support showing that greater transparency, greater uh, media uh, coverage improves the, um, uh, the effectiveness of development and security assistance, and uh, as a result, it contributes directly to improving transparency and controlling corruption. So um, I think uh, just giving more attention to it and, and the protection of uh, those covering these stories uh, would, would make a significant contribution. Turning to the question of prioritization, and Billy on that response, I think media support is um, a, a top priority uh, of mine uh, in, dis in, in, in this discussion. But I would uh, actually um, challenge the notion that the recommendations we're making are so expensive, clearly we've got to prioritize, but a lot of things we're talking about are normative changes to recognize the importance of legitima legitimacy and to shape then our engagement on the continent based on that uh, understanding. And so you know, doing more to recognize uh, leaders who are trying to play by uh, democratic rules, to differentiate between leaders who um, have attained genuine le legitimacy versus those who perpetuate their hold on power through other means. Um, Likewise, in terms of priorities and, and in terms of support, institution building, there's a lot that can be done in trying to strengthen uh, parliaments or courts in Africa that aren't necessarily expensive. It's technical assistance um, that uh, I think will go far towards building this momentum that, that we talked about. With regard to the question on uh, uh, strategic, ro strategic uh, role of U US military support, I think there's a very important lesson uh, for us to take out of the U.S. engagement in Egypt in supporting um, the professionalization of the military there and how during the protest uh, in the early part of this year, the military showed great restraint and uh, did not fire on the population, even when instructed to do so. Um, and. Uh, to the credit of the Egyptian military, um, recognize that their allegiance is to the Constitution. <coughs> and the Constitution gave people a right to protest rather than uh, to their, uh, uh, to the regime uh, in place at that time. And I think the U.S. played a critical role in building that capacity in Egypt. Um, and I uh, feel that that's a ongoing high priority for the U.S. military in the Arab world as well as in Africa um, because we expect that there are going to be a number of other instances where African militaries are going to be placed in that same position. In which direction are they going to go? This was an issue that we saw in Cote d'Ivoire. And uh, is there allegiance to the um, personality on top at the time? Is it to their profession to the, to the institutions of the state. And I think the more we can help coach them thinking about these, anticipating these challenges, the smoother that we'll see transitions moving forward. 
And finally, with regards to the questions about um, uh, uh, economics and development uh, and, and democracy, in fact, uh, there's quite a deep body of evidence um, and something I wrote a book on um, uh, looking at. And in Africa, uh, in fact, the differences are quite stark. Africa, African democracies have grown um, since 1990 at a rate of 40% higher than autocracies on average. If we take out the oil uh, producing states, African democracies grow three times as fast. Uh, when it comes to uh, socioeconomic variables, uh, agricultural yields on average are 25% higher in democracy. Infant mortality rates are 35% lower. Uh, lower. Um, uh, 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 educational attainment rates for, for primary school are 40% higher among democracies. We can go down a longer list. There are cases, like you cite, of uh, autocracies growing in, in Africa and abroad, but they are really ex exceptional. For every uh, uh, Rwanda uh, out there, you've got, as Chris said, Guinea or Angola, Cameroon, Congo, Equatorial Guinea, Gabon, Mauritania, Sudan. Globally, it's for every East, Afri East Asian tiger, there are eight or nine autocracies that have had abysmal growth. So it's, a, it's not a model to put forward for Africa to proceed. Um, and in fact, historically, um, the ability of autocracies to sustain, sustain rapid growth is actually uh, fairly limited. Um, another characteristic of these uh, polities is they tend to be highly volatile and this, uh, we'll, we'll, we'll have to see what happens uh, in, in Africa. Thank you. Thank you uh, both Joe and, and Chris, and thank you all for your very, very good questions. Um, uh, I think we probably have come pretty close to the end of, at the end of our time. I know there may be some other thoughts, questions out there. I don't know if our two panelists have a moment here to linger. Um, but um, I want to thank you all again for, for coming out this morning. Uh, thank you for your good questions and observations. So you can find out a little bit more. You can access the report if you don't have a hard copy of it on at africacenter.org. Um, and um, I do, would just finally ask that you join me in thanking uh, the working group chairman, Joe Siegel, of his colleagues.